Welcome to the rabbit hole. I'm Alice and this is Wonderland. Seriously though, hello everyone and welcome if you journeyed over to this channel from Reptiles and Research. I'm Lori, a certified animal trainer and behaviorist with behavior education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Hopefully you've just watched Liam's video and you now know that snakes share the same basic brain plan as other vertebrates with the same or homologous parts and that their nervous system produces the same neurochemicals as other vertebrates. Let's pick up there. And if you haven't already watched Liam's video, you can still watch this one. Just go back and watch his at the end. Now, back to the CNS or the central nervous system. The CNS of all vertebrates, including snakes, share the same structures and functions. Specialized nerve cells called neurons communicate with each other via electrical and chemical signals, receiving information about the environment and working out how the body and mind should respond to what's happened, to what they perceive or experience. Neurons in different parts of the brain and body are specialized for different functions. Dendrites are extensions of these neurons. They branch out like branches of a tree and spread electrochemical signals. There are synapses at various points throughout the dendritic tree, and these are like intersections between neurons where information is communicated. Neurons can grow new dendritic trees and form additional branches, creating new synapses, which adds more intersections for electrochemical communication to happen. Dendritic branching is also called dendritic aborization, which I think sounds so cool. And this equates to synaptic plasticity. That means that neurons can adapt and change based on the snake's experiences and level of environmental stimulation. Stay with me here because this is critical to understand as we talk about impoverished versus enriched environments for captive snakes. And I guess first we should start by defining what those terms mean in this context. Impoverished, deprived, and standard conditions in the snake community mean very minimalistic enclosures. Oftentimes they're just a single level with one water dish and paper for substrate. They may or may not have a hide. Many of them don't because these tubs that the snakes live in are often put in rack systems and they're arranged like drawers. There's usually no lighting, no furnishings or decor, limited space for the snake to move, and the snake may be unable to fully stretch out its body in a rectilinear position. Terms enriched, complex, and stimulating, on the other hand, mean multiple levels, climbing opportunities, burrowing opportunities, perhaps a pool area or a bigger water dish than just one that's only big enough to drink out of. Multiple hides of various sizes and types and at various heights within the enclosure. Naturalistic lighting or heat that can most closely replicate the sun. Space for full rectilinear movement and positioning. And multiple items of varied furniture and decor. Let's review the neurobiology. When two neurons repeatedly communicate with each other, they become more efficient. Neuronal communication becomes faster, dendritic branches grow, and new synapses are formed. Use it or lose it is real. When neurons don't frequently communicate, when they don't routinely interact, efficiency decreases, dendritic branches become diminished, and synaptic atrophy can occur. You guys, brains are amazing. They can adapt in response to cognitive, emotional, and environmental challenges. Nerve cells in the brain and throughout the nervous system have the capacity to continuously change when stimulated, when they're used often, and when they're used frequently by communicating with one another. Moving forward, it's really important that you remember that. The nervous system includes the brain, spine, and nerve cells, which can adapt and change. New neural connections can be generated and existing connections can grow stronger. The more communication that occurs between neurons, the more efficient they become. And synaptic plasticity occurs when the same neurons interact with each other frequently, becoming faster and more efficient. When a neural pathway is used, more synaptic connections form, more dendritic branches grow, and that pathway becomes more active, more efficient, and remains clear, like a trail well-traveled. When a neural pathway is unused or seldom used, synaptic connections fire less often and weaken. Dendritic branches fall away, the pathway is diminished, less efficient, and starts to become clouded or muddled, like an overgrown trail that you can't get through. 
This all plays a role in learning and developing and maintaining cognitive abilities and in healthy coping because it is impacted by the environment. The environment a snake develops in and lives in literally affects the structural development of the brain. The effects of impoverished versus enriched environments are well conserved across all species studied. This means, that in, this means that in every animal ever studied, those in deprived environments as opposed to those in complex environments were all impacted in similar ways. What species has this been studied in, you ask? Humans and other mammals, birds and other reptiles, including snakes, fish and insects. Yes, insects. And the bottom line from all these studies with all these different species is that bottom line for all of these studies across all of the species looked at is that impoverished environments diminish cognitive potential, reduce resiliency to adversity, limit the ability to cope with stress and adapt to change, inhibit problem solving abilities, can increase fear generalization, produce learned helplessness, and cause stereotypies. Enriched environments enhance cognitive abilities, build resiliency, strengthen an organism's ability to cope with stress and adapt to change, reduces generalized fear, and increases problem-solving abilities. And that goes for all of the species looked at. And remember that that does include a number of studies specifically done with snakes. What this means for us as keepers is that we should avoid standard conditions which tend to be minimalistic and lack mental and physical stimulation and instead provide enriched conditions which are complex and likely to be mentally and physically stimulating for the snakes. We should avoid forced handling and restraint and we should do our best to minimize fear, anxiety, and distress in our snakes to keep fear and threat responses from becoming highly reactive. Remember, neurons that communicate with each other a lot become more sensitive, the existing synapses become stronger, more dendritic branches form, and new connections are built. That's great if it happens to occur in neurons that are involved, say, in things like wayfinding, navigating difficult terrain, or climbing. The more the snake engages in these activities, the more proficient they become. They become more proficient at these activities because the neurons are frequently communicating with each other. They're frequently engaged and growing. But what if nothing happens in the neurons that are involved in things like navigation, problem solving, investigating novelty, moving the body long distances, exercising, or seeking resources? What if the neurons that are constantly firing and being active are the ones involved in things like fear learning, defensive behavior, or threat responses? This leads us straight to the amygdala. Neurons in the amygdala communicate emotions, including fear, and initiate survival responses such as fight, flight, freeze, or other actions related to keeping the snake safe from a perceived threat. The amygdala is a tiny structure at the end of the hippocampus and produces fear when stimulated, and highly emotional events are ingrained in the snake's memory. This happens when emotional arousal in the form of distress produces norepinephrine, stimulating the amygdala and triggers memory systems to engage and emotional learning occurs. The inability to experience fear actually results if the amygdala is damaged. While the amygdala is busy with emotional learning, including fear learning, the hippocampus is busy with context memory and episodic learning, cognitive processing, inhibition of stress, and extinction of fear and other reactivity. Fear extinction can't happen if the hippocampus is damaged or if the neurons in the hippocampus aren't firing. If they are diminished from lack of use, the hippocampus won't be very effective at providing context when the amygdala is being emotional and activating the fear response. If you've already watched Liam's video about reptilian brain structure, you know that the dorsal ventricular ridge in snakes and other reptiles is believed to be homologous with the mammalian neocortex. This brings us to the dorsal pallium, the possible reptile homologue of the prefrontal cortex in mammals, which regulates emotion, plays a role in inhibition, and maintains appropriate fear extinction. It's the part of the neocortex in mammals, or possibly the dorsal pallium in reptiles, that's involved in executive functions, such as planning and goal-directed behavior. When the neurons in this area aren't regularly used, they become diminished. Emotional regulation, inhibition, and fear extinction aren't going to happen. 
We can inadvertently create a situation where the neurons in the parts of the brain that enhance learning, coping, resiliency, and quell unnecessary fear and emotions are weak, diminished, and not working well, while the parts of the brain that initiate emotional responses, stimulate fear learning, and maintain high reactivity for survival are communicating rapidly, communicating often, and becoming more and more sensitive. We have in essence created a snake that instead of experiencing emotions appropriately has developed maladaptive reactivity to environmental stimuli and is a generally fearful, defensive, and a highly reactive individual. Not in TC's case, because obviously I have nurtured him and trained him and given him tons and tons of environmental stimulation and enrichment, and he's built problem solving skills and resiliency and a tolerance to stress. In conclusion, optimal welfare for snakes under captive management includes providing them with as many options as possible, giving them opportunities to exercise their minds and bodies, and allowing them choice and control over their own behavior. Providing complex environments or access to enrichment areas with appropriate challenges and opportunities for the snakes to have agency and make decisions about what activities to engage in and when will foster learning, build resiliency, and strengthen coping abilities. This is the case even if the snake is exposed to environmental complexity and cognitive stimulation for even short periods of time on a regular basis. Teaching snakes to voluntarily participate in their own care through cooperative care training, utilizing the least intrusive, most effective methods to provide care, and implementing choice-based instead of force-based handling will build the snake's confidence and trust in people, minimize fear, anxiety, and distress, reduce the need for physical or chemical restraint, improve keeper safety, prevent objective and subjective forms of learned helplessness, and improve overall welfare. Everyone, thank you so much for watching and joining me for this look into reptile cognition, specifically with snakes. And I appreciate your interest as always in snake training and behavior, as well as snake enrichment and welfare. If you haven't already checked out Liam's video about the brain structure of snakes, please go back and catch that. And until next time, everybody please remember to always be kind and love your animals. Please be sure to take a look at the video description on YouTube for all of the references and citations for the information in this video.